Guten Abend, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, wieder bei Matt spricht mit im Hochhaus der Architekturikone der Moderne im Herzen Wiens. Und ich freue mich heute ganz besonders, John und Doris Nesbitt als Gäste bei mir zu haben. Ausnahmsweise zwei Personen, die mit mir sprechen, aber sie haben gemeinsam sehr viel Interessantes und Überzeugendes zur Zukunft der Welt gesagt, über die Zukunft der Welt nachgedacht und haben gemeinsam faszinierende Bücher geschrieben und sind sozusagen als Team eine intellektuelle Einheit. Daher heute Doris und John Nesbitt. Herzlich willkommen. Danke. Ich darf für unser Fernsehpublikum kurz die beiden vorstellen. Ich beginne mit John Nesbitt. John Nesbitt ist amerikanischer Schriftsteller und für viele so etwas wie ein globaler Philosoph unter den Zukunftsdenkern. Er hat das Wort Megatrends erfunden und die Globalisierung bekannt gemacht. Nesbitt hat sein Buch Megatrends 1982 veröffentlicht und es wurde zum internationalen Bestseller. Wir haben gerade vorher darüber gesprochen, wie viele Exemplare davon verkauft wurden. Also es sind mindestens 14 Millionen, wahrscheinlich noch mehr, weil sehr viele in China auch verkauft wurden, zum Teil als Nachdrucke. Ein ungemein erfolgreiches Buch, in 57 Ländern publiziert und es dominierte sehr lange die Bestsellerliste der New York Times. John Nesbitt verblüfft seit mehr als 20 Jahren mit seinen Prognosen über die Zukunft. Nach seinen Studien der Politik, Politikwissenschaften in Harvard und anderen amerikanischen Universitäten arbeitet er zuerst im Management von Kodak und IBM. Mit 34 wurde Nesbitt stellvertretender Erziehungsminister unter John F. Kennedy und später dann Special Assistant für den amerikanischen Präsidenten Lyndon B. Johnson. Seit dem Erscheinungsjahr seines Erstlingswerks Megatrend steht als Vortragender im Rampenlicht internationaler Veranstaltungen, hatte eine Gastprofessur in Harvard an der Staatlichen Universität in Moskau und äh, übt eine sehr, also weltweit eigentlich eine Vortragstätigkeit aus, wobei sein Interesse in seit vielen Jahren vor allem Asien und da der Analyse der Entwicklung Chinas gilt. John Nesbitt ist Chairman des John Nesbitt China Institutes in Tianjin. Er ist Professor der Nankai und Tianjin Universität für Finanzen und Wirtschaft und er ist Träger von 15 Ehrendoktoraten. Doris Nesbitt ist Österreicherin und arbeitet in ihrer Jugend für Fernsehdokumentation, ich glaube auch für Walter Davi, ja. stimmt, ja. Äh, studierte vorher Mode und Schauspiel bei Susi Nicoletti und Paula Wesseli und blickt auf eine Karriere im Verlagswesen zurück. Unter anderem äh, war, war sie, äh, leitete sie den Signum Verlag, wo sie auch Bücher von John Nesbitt äh, veröffentlichte und herausgab, auch bei deutschen Verlagen Bertelsmann, Hansa, war äh, Doris Nesbitt tätig. 2000 heirateten die beiden und äh, brachten in Folge gemeinsam sehr spannende Bücher heraus, über die wir auch sprechen werden. Das neueste Buch ist Global Game Change, How the Global Southern Belt Will Reshape Our World. Das ist im Jahr 2015 auf Deutsch erschienen. Und Macht, Macht, Ma ja, Machtwende. Und ich glaube, Sie arbeiten zurzeit schon wieder an neuen Büchern. Stimmt das? Ja, das stimmt. Ja? Okay. Also, äh, da sind wir schon neugierig. Wann wird das nächste herauskommen? Naja, das ähm, wird jetzt zuerst in, it's going to be published in uh, yeah. China and Korea first, yeah. and it depends on mm -hmm. how fast, you know, the rest of the world mm -hmm. is. But that's yeah. how it goes now. Yeah. Sie leben beide in Wien, yeah. zum Teil in Tianjin, und das Wall Street Journal hat John Nesbitt's uh, Arbeit triumphantly useful genannt, taking bearings in all directions and giving us the courage to do the same. So, the interview will now be held in English, as John doesn't speak German, he understands a little bit. John, you published your visionary book Megatrends already in 1982. It's followed by Megatrends uh, for the 90s, and then there was Megatrends for Asia. Where were you right? Where were you definitely wrong in your prognosis? Uh, <coughs> Well, the, the, the returns are not all in, because uh, <laughs> right. uh, as we anticipate mm -hmm. uh, changes down the line, but uh, I think that uh, the, the most important thing 
was identifying uh, how things were changing because people were just getting settled in mm -hmm. at a time when things were changing incredibly mm -hmm. and we're, we're beginning to change and people get settled in and they they feel that they're that they've got a handle on things and just that have, particularly in recent years the changes are coming faster and faster mm -hmm. and faster and so are the books <laughs> yes, referring that we just finished <laughs> two in one year. <laughs> but at, the, at, at that time, what were the f maybe three major trends you anticipated already in the 80s, which are still... I think Can he's sh on. a little shy in, uh, yeah? in praising himself. No, we let's do that. Let's praise. <laughs> Well, what, what, what do you think of the medical well, experiences? Yeah. It's the change from, the, mm -hmm. um, uh, from industrial to information mm -hmm. society. It's certainly uh, the uh, globalization that he uh, uh, yeah. foresaw. But I must say, mm -hmm. you know, when we uh, got together in 94 as uh, author and publisher, mm -hmm. yes. it was Megatrans Asia at a time when people said, oh, that's all not true, mm -hmm. and then came the financial crisis in right. Asia, and people said, oh, mm -hmm. he was all wrong. Mm -hmm. So um, one should always, as John just said, one has to wait sometimes right. Right. until the, the unfolding, uh, the, the speed in which things mm -hmm. unfold mm -hmm. is sometimes faster, and then sometimes it just takes longer. For example, with Megatrans women. Yeah? Oh. Not yet there. It's still going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that, that uh, <coughs> my most successful book by far, uh, in a way, was Megatrends, the original book, which sold millions right. and millions right. of copies all over the place. The biggest failure uh, was about two years later, three years later, you went there. Uh, Megatrends for Women, which I was very excited about, it didn't sell at all. People didn't want to hear it. <laughs> Even women didn't want to hear it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but you saw uh, a, a glorious future for women in the book. So what? Yeah, uh, the future you saw for the women was bright. Well, yeah. well it's, pl it's starting to play out mm -hmm. much more. And particularly in, I have a sense, do you, in the last three or four years, it's really gaining momentum and, and mm -hmm. strength and so on. It's, it's starting to play out, yes. What made you to write a book about megatrends? What made a successful manager an author? How did it come? Um, how did it come? Uh, uh, just being totally uh, arrested by the change the changes that begin to occur that had such promise, had such promise. And it take, took a long time for them to play out. But the promise was there, and the promise is beginning to be fulfilled. So you, you were yourself fascinated by those changes. But that, was oh that absolutely. one of the reasons to write it about oh it? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean because, you know, because the, may I say, yeah. that, uh, and, part and particularly the dominance of the West, the West for 200 years has run the, run the world. And, you know, in recent years, even back uh, half a dozen years or so, it was clear that the European Union was going to go down, down, down. And, stuff. and things that were moving um, were starting to really manifest themselves. Mm -hmm. And they happened somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, you wrote an incredible bestseller. Did the immense success of the book surprise you? Did it surprise me? Well, it, it didn't happen overnight. It wasn't, yeah. you know, the next day. So that the returns started to come in and they started to build. And so I got sort of got, I sort of got used to it. <laughs> and then it just sort of kept going. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, as you know, on the New York Times bestseller list for mm -hmm. two years. No book had ever done that before. Uh, uh, most of the time, uh, uh, number one, mm -hmm. and it w and I just got very, very comfortable with it. Especially mm -hmm. opening the New York Times every Saturday, <laughs> <laughs> checking if you're still Ch there. Checking <laughs> if I'm still there. 
uh, may I ask you where do you come from? In which context, context you grew up and how did <laughs> this influence your further life and career? <laughs> well, it might surprise you. I was born and raised on a farm in a little town yeah. in Utah. Glenwood, Utah. <laughs> Not even 200 people. Mm -hmm. And most of them Danish immigrants. And I'm half Danish and half yeah. Scottish. Yeah. Uh, my, my mother met a Scotsman later <laughs> on. <Okay. laughs> right? But, <clears throat> but it was... Uh, but the, what happened was that I, I really wasn't very exciting, as you can imagine, in this farming community of a couple hundred people, mostly from Denmark. And so when I was uh, 17, uh, I, I, told, I said I wanted to join the Marine Corps because mm -hmm. I wanted to get out. To get and out my parents, me. I was a little scrawny kid, mm -hmm. and my parents thought, there's no way this guy's going to get accepted in the Marine Corps. Well, surprise, surprise, I was, mm -hmm. because they were so, it's the end of the war, right at the end, they were so hard up for, for, peop, for men in the Marine Corps that they took me. <laughs> and that got me out of Utah, got mm -hmm. me out of Glenwood, got me out of this con very contained, uh, simplified uh, society, and I started to see the world, and I mm -hmm. did travel a lot in connection with that. And I, it just, my mind just exploded. Mm -hmm. I just thought, this is it. I've got to get out, really find out about things. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't, at that time, think I would be reporting about them, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to know. But you were curious. Oh, I wanted to know very and badly. And you still are. Yeah, <laughs> and still am. Yeah. <laughs> After Curiosity is a contagious disease, too. Mm -hmm. and it, it goes on and on. <laughs> yeah, but it's a disease which keeps uh, uh, being bored away. No boredom. <laughs> Anyway, after your studies at a young age, what attracted you to go into politics, to work for John F. Kennedy? And how was the spirit in his team? Well, I got out of the Marine Corps and I had not gone to high school. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, but but I've been, I discovered reading and I read lots of books in, in, in the Marine Corps. And there's not, not much else to do. <laughs> but... Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I, I knew I had to go to the university, so I w went back to Utah, and I went to the university, and I said I wanted to go to the university. I said, well, you haven't even been to high school. But I've been, I had the GI Bill, mm -hmm. and uh, so I talked my way into it, and they said, but only if you take uh, basic English, because Glenwood, Utah is not <laughs> a paragon <laughs> of language <laughs> development. Uh, and, and so, I, I did, and I got so interested in it that I just kept taking English courses while I was in college. And you got interested in politics, too. In you got interested in politics. Oh, absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. Well, I was, I, be, I was elected student by president. And what, what, what brought you to John F. Kennedy and in the, his administration? What brought you in? Um, well, th they had a search team. Mm -hmm. uh, to to fill a, a, a post in the in the uh, in the uh, in the education department, and that that search team found me, mm -hmm. and then they presented me to the pre to the president, and he liked me, and I guess, and I liked him, and uh, and then that started my career in Washington, which mm -hmm. was very very interesting, uh, interesting time. You also worked for Lyndon B. Johnson later. Uh, when, when, when the president, uh, Kennedy, when the president was killed, um, I mean, that was uh, unbelievable blow to all of us. And the, and, and Johnson became president and, uh, and then the, the Johnson people and Johnson, uh, sent for me to come to the White House to be a, an aide in, in the White House. And so I did that for a couple of years. But then that ended because Johnson got, if you remember, got very involved in Vietnam and he had 5,000 and more than, no, than right. 25,000, 25,000 troops in Vietnam. Yes. And I and a whole bunch of people just couldn't stand it, so I quit. And I got a yeah. job at IBM. But at the same time, he did a lot for civil rights, no? Oh, absolutely. So do you think that he, because all everyone talks about Kennedy, do you think that Johnson is an underestimated president? Uh, no, because everyone understands that no one else could have gotten the Civil Rights Bill through. Yeah. And he was 
so, uh, just so tenacious, so tough, and I watched this. It's unbelievable. He would almost literally take senators by the scuff of the neck, not really, but, <laughs> and mm -hmm. say, you know, God damn it, you're going to vote for this. Mm -hmm. You hear me? You're going to vote for this. <laughs> and he was very, very tough, and he got it done. I read that uh, there is an important book for your life. It's called Lust for Life by Irving Stone. Uh, is it right? Yeah. And uh, why is that book so important? Well, it was just that. It was mm -hmm. just that. It was the manifestations of mm -hmm. lust for life and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, the stimulus and the drive mm -hmm. it can give you and, mm -hmm. and so on. Absolutely. May I ask you now, you both, where and how did you meet? Oh, <laughs> that's on you. <laughs> um, I was uh, um, head of a publishing mm -hmm. house uh, in, in Vienna, and uh, our and our editor, mm -hmm. uh, we had a, 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 a meeting, Werbewirtschaftliche um, Tagung in Villach, and uh, John Doesn't was sound the so interesting, no? key speaker. Okay. And uh, I remember very well, I was walking uh, uh, somewhere and our editor uh, came and said, Doris, you bring us Nesbit. And I said, no problem. For this publishing house. For, yeah. for yeah. Signum, yeah. yeah. So I was in Villach and uh, mm -hmm. I had to get him. Mm -hmm. So I approached him, which was not easy and it just uh, happened by coincidence. I, I, I sort of grabbed him. And I told him I would like to publish mm -hmm. your next book. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, okay, we can talk about it. And uh, he said he'd call and he called mm -hmm. and I flew to New York and, and that's okay. how it started. And some when you uh, didn't even publish a book of, uh, of uh, you even wrote a book together, no? Yeah, and that, that yeah? was not foreseeable, yeah. yeah. But <laughs> would you say that two birds of a feather flock together in that case or how would you describe uh, well, we, we... I mean, a mutual, you mutually profited from each other in certain ways uh, in... Well, yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. I, I just... Uh, uh, birds flocking together, it doesn't really capture... I'm sorry, <laughs> can't <laughs> capture the, <laughs> the situation. Okay. <laughs> yeah, tell I was me wondering what too. <laughs> the situation. <laughs> No. <laughs> okay. No, uh, it was mm -hmm. very simple. I mm -hmm. was I was totally ambitious. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make that project mm -hmm. uh, the best uh, Signum ever had, which of course was uh, a challenge. We we started to work very mm -hmm. well together. It was a very uh, uh, productive uh, mm -hmm. uh, work relationship, which uh, of course also brought us closer together. Right. And you know how it goes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seldom <laughs> with author and publisher, but in our yeah, case... Yeah, seldom <laughs> with author and <laughs> publisher, that's right. It's a dangerous <laughs> relation anyway. <laughs> uh, but for you, John, is there a look back, not in anger, but in melancholy, thinking of your youth in America, looking back at the time when the country was prosperous, the leader of the post-Second World War world, an America of good citizens, intact families, and strong middle classes with a glorious future. You know, the, f the future generation was supposed to be richer, healthier, happier. An America which disappeared. An America... Which disappeared. Do you look back in melancholy? Oh, you Ameri is America that is yeah. now disappeared. This, yeah, now it disappeared. Oh, now but disappeared. you're America of your youth, yeah? <laughs> Is there a look back in melancholy, or do you look in future and think that things will be better anyway? No, I, I, I don't look back in melancholy. No. I mean, it, it was, it was uh, the, the, there were great times and, and, and great accomplishments mm -hmm. in America, without question. Uh, that time has slowed down to... Um, A, a, a problem. <laughs> a problem. <laughs> or so yeah. How should we characterize mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. No, uh, but it can't come back. But America has to realize that th the is America in the West is not running the world anymore. That's over, and they've got to earn their their place in the world again. 
And they're not really taking that seriously. Certainly Trump is not taking it seriously. He's just finding fault and name calling and so forth. No, the West in that little part, you know, 17% of the population of the world up there at the top has been running the world for 200 years. That's over. And those folks have to realize it. Those folks uh, uh, have to realize that, that they've got to reconceptualize or do something to rejuvenate mm -hmm. their, their, uh, their dream, the, the American dream and the European dream, if that's the point, and so on. No, they've c that's, it's, it's a game changer. That's our, our latest book, one of our latest books. We'll talk the about global, this too, yeah. Global game right. change. That's the global game right. change. The change from the, the West running things for a couple hundred years to that mm -hmm. being over and the, what we call the, the Southern Belt. Uh, right. Uh, all those countries China and, and Asia are really, uh, yeah. We'll talk about this, but uh, yeah. uh, to make it short and, and, and talking about America. So the American dream will not come back mm. by the slogan America first. <laughs> that, uh, that dream of that particular person will <laughs> not happen. <laughs> 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 the subtitle of Megatrends is 10 New Directions Transforming Our Lives. <coughs> Would you say, after now 40 years, or maybe nearly 40 years that book was written, that it transformed to the better or to the worse? That, 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 that America? No, no, this, the, I said the New Directions Transforming Our Lives. Would yeah. you say, after, I think, Oh. 35 years, to be concrete, that uh, it, the life's transferred to the better or to the worse? Well, I in many ways, the opportunities are greater, and the, w and the ways of accomplishing things are, are, are easier and more, uh, more attractive and uh, more dynamic, certainly more dynamic, but it's up to us. It's up to us to, to embrace that and to capture that and to do something with it. And we're not doing it in the U.S. We, I'm, I don't live in and the in U.S. Europe. anymore. It, but uh, and Europe is not, oh, Europe, Europe has been going down, down, down f for, for 15 years. Mm -hmm. It's the, just bumping up against zero growth. And, it, and it, they go keep pretending that uh, it's all okay and we're going to fix it and so on. No, it's not going to fix it. It's got to be reconceptualized. Mm -hmm. We spoke a lot about, thought about globalization. But globalization, isn't it a phenomenon we know already from the Roman Empire, from the Hansa, from the East Indian Company in the British Empire? What's new about globalization of today? If you compare it with the global phenomenon we already had in the history of mankind. No, no, no. Globalization today is everyone being in touch with everyone else. That means that, that is an entirely fast communication. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely, mm -hmm. and and being able to work together thereby, work together, do things together, discover things together, change things, mm -hmm. make things better. You know, it's the the the, the, the context is so much richer and, and with possibilities than it was uh, when I first started thinking about this. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the growing criticism of globalization? People say there is <laughs> more pollution. <laughs> no, 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 the people who are right. criticizing globalization are those who are losing ground. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it, they're mostly the West. Right. Oh, the it's just the West. It's the best. Sure. Yeah, but you, uh, you, know, sorry. you can't, you can't stop globalization anyway. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. that you're st standing up and say, "I'm against globalization." Mm -hmm. Bang! Next morning, we don't mm -hmm. have it anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, no. uh, and besides, uh, you know, we we uh, there is a, a justification of the people who do not are not sympathetic with the globalization it is now. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, we must say, China comes in which uh, does a very different way. In fact, they are uh, uh, talking about the re 
uh, inventing globalization, right. by going to the inland countries, mm -hmm. by going to the hinterland, by mm -hmm. bringing infrastructure to those regions that were neglected and didn't have access uh, in many ways to uh, the benefits of globalization. Mm -hmm. So I think over, over time, uh, the, uh, the approach and the uh, impact of globalization will shift. And, mm -hmm. and that's the process we specially described in, in, in mm -hmm. Machtwende too, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that uh, the beneficiaries uh, will be much more mm -hmm. in the uh, emerging economies. In the long run. But what do you think about this strange alliance, in a way, of the left and the right? Let's say... Which uh, alliance? Yeah. I would say, you know, protectionism. Protectionism is an answer <coughs> against globalization now uh, as well from the left as the right. So, uh, from Trump to some uh, NGOs. No, it's not an answer. An answer no. would mean that mm -hmm. they are moving something. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a propaganda. It's, a, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's just words. Mm -hmm. But These are the losers that are talking, including Trump. <laughs> no, including <laughs> Trump. Okay. Um, if you think of the, of the Club of Rome, long time ago, and the idea, uh, Dennis Meadows and the others, and their idea of the limit of growth, that was a very negative vision about the future. Your vision of the future is opposed to that, is very positive. I think I even read that you think that uh, global warming and all these kind of negative aspects of growth are just temporary. We never said that. No? No, not, uh, not that they mm -hmm. are temporary, yeah. but it's up to us. It's not uh, like mm -hmm. a destiny mm -hmm. that we are running into. Uh, yeah, that's the it point. is, yeah. It yeah. is uh, if we deal with those things in a reasonable mm -hmm. manner, if we don't uh, um, exaggerate on one hand and do nothing on the other hand, because verbally everybody is talking about what's necessary and painting the, the, the dramatic scenarios, but what's happening on the ground? What does each one of us do to avoid unnecessary uh, burdening of the environment? So in this sense, I think uh, you have always been positive, and I, I remember when we met each other in 94, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, he he always looked into the future with a very positive eye, mm -hmm. and in fact, it, it's the optimism that brings you forward. It doesn't lead to anything to look mm -hmm. into the future with pessimism, because then you don't have the energy to move things. Right. <laughs> so that would have been my next question: What makes you so optimistic about the future? This was already an answer. Uh, but is there any danger in the future which you really fear? Is there something you fear? with all the optimism. He's pretty fearless. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, that I think uh, uh, we talked about that uh, um, Trump, as president mm -hmm. of the US, could get the world in very dangerous situations. That's but but I think that the whole world would learn a lot of lessons in the process. Yeah, if it's it might not be too worth late. it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you you are an unshakable, <laughs> steadfast optimist. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you are maybe both. You maybe even more a, a child of the Cold War generation, where everyone was afraid from a nuclear war. Was this a fear which was forgotten without any good reason? Or, in other words, is the world far away of this negative scenario? Well, it's further away than it's been in episodically mm -hmm. in, 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 in the past. In your youth. Yeah, it, yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, I remember, as, as a much younger person, being pretty scared about all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's over. Well... <sighs> The mindset mm -hmm. has been reduced, mm -hmm. uh, and the people who share that mindset said has been has been reduced tremendously. Mm -hmm. You deal with future, but future seems to be in question. Maybe today more than ever before, especially in Western countries, because I remember, like my parents, they really believed in future. Everything w should be new and modern, a new house. New things, old things were thrown away. The younger generation loves antiques. 
goes to flea markets, wears the fashion of the past. So what happened? What has changed? And does this spirit influence your work? <laughs> I, I don't recognize the description. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I'm not so sure whether the young uh, generation really loves antiques. Though. Yeah. <laughs> no, but there is a trend even even uh, even retro. in yeah yeah not only retro trend there is it's going even on if you think of uh, the protection of the past national heritage that got gets stronger and stronger. But that's people not are that's opposed. That's not a protectionist thing. The people are opposed against. Uh, tower buildings, new things. Is that a European phenomenon only? Well, I don't. Uh, how widespread is that? Sorry? I don't think that's very widespread. Well, I think in Vienna, it's well in, in Europe. It's in Europe, that's why I ask you. Is, well, this, Europe, a Euro is Europe, this a European said, problem? Europe is going down, down, down. Europe is has to wake up because <laughs> it, it keeps. So it's a European problem. In a way, this strong belief in the past and being bound to the past, something you maybe don't find in China. No, I, I don't even <coughs> see that yeah. really in Austria, mm -hmm. that the young people are bound to the past. You I don't think so? I don't. No. No? no? I, just, I mean, just recently, uh, w whatever you want to build in the city, especially if it's a, uh, a tower building, Creates a lot of opposition. Yeah, but that's well, a that's different, a different matter. thing. That's a different thing. In China, thing. wouldn't happen. No, no, no. no. China mm. has made its uh, <laughs> uh, uh, own mistakes mm. in destroying the past, yeah. not not its mm -hmm. history. They're mm. very proud of their history, but uh, uh, during the Cultural Revolution, they they destroyed all the buildings, the, the mm. temples, and so forth. They wouldn't do that today anymore. Right. But um, but I'm not sure whether that's the population which is really against mm. uh, a modernization. New things, yeah. And then mm -hmm. uh, also yeah, you yeah. have to differentiate between what really makes sense and mm -hmm. what doesn't make mm -hmm. sense. Uh, to keep uh, a special structure for Vienna uh, is certainly not a bad idea, mm -hmm. especially if Europe goes down uh, economically and on in, in, in a way. And we cannot... So you think we need more tourism? We, then we ha at least have tourism, <laughs> but I think we can't make the mistake mm -hmm. when we say mm -hmm. uh, Europe is going down. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that companies can't flourish. Right. That doesn't mean that people don't make careers. Uh, you know, it's and also the countries in Europe are not all the same. So uh, it's, uh, you can, while you can talk in general and say, uh, some economies are emerging, are very dynamic. Uh, it doesn't always tell you specifically if you look to certain professions, to certain uh, people, to certain interest groups, that mm -hmm. they all share the same future, so to say. So there is still some optimism for Europe, even if you said before it's going down. Well, it's, down. Being, t it's being tested uh, pretty strongly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But... but um, no, but Europe has to, has to let go of the idea of, like the European Union, we're going to fix it, and you know, we've got all these quarrels now, and we, uh, we know we've been down, we don't, they, we don't acknowledge that we're down to zero growth for the last uh, d d decade, but you know, they've got to acknowledge what's happening and it has to be fixed. But they just keep going saying, oh, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, it's, gonna it's not going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Unless it's fixed, unless it's changed. Uh, in, I think it was in the book Mindset, where uh, <coughs> another very successful book, I, I suppose, uh, and you already worked together for Mindset. Yeah? It's also about the rules, how to analyze the future, but there is one basic idea is that people seem to forget that most things are stable and not changing. So. What has to be stable? What is stable in your opinion? Uh, With uh, all the change. This afternoon I was yeah. at the Sofa, mm -hmm. Sofa Gespräche uh, yeah. uh, uh, with the Wifi and there was mm -hmm. the, the theme was Veränderung. Mm -hmm. And already in, in Mindset we wrote that uh, uh, the, the basic needs we have do not change. And uh, that's what we experience, uh, for example, when we are talking to young people in China. There are two main questions they have. How do I find the right partner in life? How do I find the profession that is the best for me? 
And uh, if you find the right answer to those two <laughs> questions, then you have fulfillment in life. Mm -hmm. And the basic needs are like that. I mean, if you have uh, work that is satisfying, right. if you can even share the work with somebody mm -hmm. you love, you then, do. you know, mm -hmm. everything is manageable. But the, the problem is that uh, uh, our education system is not looking for the talents in people, but to eliminate the weaknesses. So why not uh, look where the person has talent? Why not support the talent so that people can find out what they are really good at and then turn to a profession uh, that gives them a satisfactory working mm -hmm. life? Do you see a country where the educational system uh, faces these needs better than it does like in Austria or Europe? Well, it's a question whether the PISA studies give you the right <laughs> answer, but certainly certain schools can give you the right mm -hmm. answer. For example, and mm -hmm. uh, as far as I know, Montessori mm -hmm. does a much better job. Uh, international schools are doing much better jobs. They don't put the pressure on the children mm -hmm. as much as our mm -hmm. system does, but it's more a playful learning. And creativity can flourish much better under an open and uh, relaxed mm -hmm. condition than if you have rote learning. Uh, right, but that would speak against the school system in Asian countries. Absolutely, Which absolutely. Which are very authoritarian and, now. And, and they are working mm -hmm. against, uh, I mean, they are, they are trying to reform, but not very different than here. Mm -hmm. The reforms are much slower than they should mm -hmm. be. There is another book of yours, High Tech, High Touch. I think it's a book where you emphasize the growing importance of culture and the arts for society. Among other things, yeah. yeah. Why do you think <coughs> that the arts and culture will be more important in the future? Uh, is that a serious question? <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I, mean, I, 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 I believe in culture, I love I, the arts, I and think I work with I the arts. As you do, yeah. I think that's a given. Mm -hmm. That's a, uh, that's got to be part of the mix, the the things that that, that celebrate us as human beings have to be part of as a given, as part of of what education is, mm -hmm. and, and so on. I I, I don't have to. Uh, uh, you know, I ask you because uh, the uh, especially the Asian system is very competitive and people work very hard, and they work a lot. So when do they have time for the arts, for culture, and for rest? Yeah, that's a big problem. And, and uh, there, there's uh, a, a lot of experimentation that's beginning uh, to take place to, to address that very consideration which people are becoming more and more concerned about in, in, in China as it becomes economically more and more successful. And they do strategically uh, support art. For mm. example, they create villages uh, for artists and they have several levels. We've been to three levels, mm. maybe there are right. some which have more, where the, the housing and the support is rather modest, that's for the beginners. Then the others get a little better support. Those are the ones that already have been sorted out mm. and come up. And then, then you have the big stars, and uh, they live in, 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 a, in a community uh, mm -hmm. with uh, you know grand villas, but mm -hmm. they get all the support they need. They sell their, they don't need money anymore, but they get uh, the emotional support, they uh, teach, they uh, give an example to the other uh, uh, young people. But still, there is also a lot of discussion about censorship in China, and I go further and would say, is the success of Chinese economy, which is very competitive, is it also based on the fact that the state is still a totalitarian, not democratic state? And, to and in consequence, can the European democratic system be competitive towards a totalitarian capitalist system? Or do we have to give up, uh, do we have to give up our freedom to be competitive? Which you maybe who who in the West would concede mm -hmm. that an authoritarian system is better than 
and what we've worked for many, many generations to, to perfect. No one. No one, okay. Right. Yeah. And then, nor would we. But do we have, what, what, which changes do we have to face that we, in future, will be competitive <coughs> with China? Well, uh, if you look at the Chinese system... It's not our democratic system, no. No, it's a different mm -hmm. system, but mm -hmm. it also has yeah, different roots, and mm -hmm. the people have dis different demands. Mm -hmm. But in general, whether that's good or bad, uh, it is a system with a strong and long-term strategic planning. Uh, they make their 100-year plan, they make their 50-year plan, and then they have the five-year plans in which they check where they are, do we have to adjust. Uh, when the Chinese do something, mm -hmm. it doesn't come out of the blue, it doesn't mm -hmm. come out of a mood. It's a long-term thinking to a goal they want to achieve. And the but, but our problem is, or oh, yeah. no, maybe our advantage is that we have, ele that we have elections yeah, all exactly. four or five years. Yeah. But this is part of democracy. Yeah, but uh, then we and have to allow think. a long term plan. Then we have to think mm -hmm. how can we eliminate uh, election driven thinking mm -hmm. without giving up the freedom of choice right. in, in politics. Mm -hmm. That's a big but question. That's a big question. But, yeah. a big question. Uh, but it's a reality. And if we look back to the, to the <coughs> past, you know, after the uh, uh, wars, uh, the politicians were much more willing to cooperate. Now we're into a total confrontation, which of course then right. gives the opportunity to mm -hmm. populists to rise. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we seriously have to think about how to stay competitive with a strategically planned uh, mm -hmm. and very smartly planned, because they all are very uh, well educated. They take experts from all over the world into China. They invite right. them. They invite them to the Communist Party School to talk about everything, including democracy. We've mm -hmm. been there too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, this openness mm -hmm. that the Chinese have to mm -hmm. let knowledge in, if we would have the same openness and say, okay, now what can we do? What can we learn maybe from them? Uh, that we don't see to happen. What can we learn from them? You, you answered already a little bit that question, especially openness. Yeah. Uh, especially openness, and then uh, they have their quarrels, they have their different opinions, but at the end they mm -hmm. decide for a way to go. Mm -hmm. And they have a very, you know, the justification for the, chi for the Communist mm -hmm. Party uh, to run the country is economic progress. If the Chinese would not see that their life is going to be better and better, right. and the opportunities are rising, uh, then the the political system would sooner or later collapse. Would collapse, yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. it's a really, and we have had uh, conversations with all levels of government. We've been to to many provinces, mm -hmm. small cities. They, by the way, have elections mm -hmm. uh, in about 800, 900,000 villages. Mm -hmm. They elect their village leaders, and the village leader promises, "I'm going to build a school. I'm going to do this and that." If they do not deliver, they are kicked out, and number two rises to the top position. Mm -hmm. So, you know, lots of what's happening in China in their political system, rigid as it is, is also not known. Mm -hmm. what, in you, what are the weaknesses of the Chinese system, in your opinion? The rigidity uh, that you that you come across in, in th those kinds of societies, even though uh, there's, there's a lot of change going on in China. When you ask a question about such a question, it's not that it's fixed, it's that it's in process. Mm -hmm. It's in, uh, I, I don't know if it's in progress, <laughs> but it's, in, it's mm -hmm. in process of change and experimentation. The a lot of that going on. You know, on one hand, they are <laughs> totally uh, in support of uh, education, the best education right. possible. At the same time, of course, people who are well-educated have higher demands. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not enough anymore for the Chinese just to make money mm-hmm. for most. You know, you, you, right. you have a certain right. need, you need to buy a house, you need to, mm-hmm. to do all of this. But there are also needs in, 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 in what's the, the sense of living, what's the, uh, how do I get fulfillment? Right. Uh, so uh, the, the government has to adapt to the growing demands of the middle class. Mm-hmm. When they started, there was no middle class. Now you have a, a 300, 400 million middle class. And the people are quite affluent, the people are well educated. And, and, <coughs> and, and so it's, in, in one book we described it as, a, um, you know, you have the bottom up forces and you have the top down uh, directions. Mm-hmm. And, and those two forces have to keep an equilibrium. Mm -hmm. If that clashes, China is in big trouble. And the relationship of those two things changes a lot Mm -hmm. as as the situation in China changes. Right. You called China uh, (coughs) in the book a a global game changer, you called it the game changer. So, uh, but the book deals with the idea that the whole southern belt uh, will end the dominance of the West in a way. But there is big differences. There is Africa, there is South America, China, India. You didn't uh, say that India is the game changer. And you didn't say that... China, <laughs> India is dead in the water. <laughs> okay. India talks a good game and does nothing. We were there mm-hmm. very right? recently. Mm-hmm. And it was so interesting because we've been witnessing this for a long time. Lots of talk. And, and very questionable growth figures and so forth. But we, we talked to a lot of young reporters who came to interview us, and we had many talks that went on and on and on. And every single p- person finally came around and said, boy, it's really bad here. Nothing is happening. Right. All, it's all talk and no action. All mm-hmm. talk and no action. We saw, heard that over and over again from young reporters who were really so frustrated for what's going on. It's not happening in India. They but talk a good game to the world, but it's not happening in India. Africa is a part of the Southern Belt and also the Arab states. Do you think it's happening there, honestly? In some places. Yeah. China is investing enormously into African infrastructure. I know. Yeah. And, and, and uh, also, uh, by the way, uh, in the, into Latin America. Yeah, right. yeah. And if you look at the history of China, mm-hmm. uh, uh, ch- uh, it started with infrastructure. If you don't have infrastructure, you cannot sell your goods. Right. If you uh, don't have infrastructure, you cannot uh, uh, go to different places. So uh, they are actually exporting the pattern that led them to their success. They, are, they, they have a very different uh, approach. They are not giving charity. Uh, they are doing investments, and uh, di- either directly or by private mm-hmm. companies, uh, Chinese companies. And uh, we have not spent uh, much time in Africa, but we deal a lot with people who spend a lot of time in mm-hmm. Africa. And, uh, and also, you can, of course, read the, the, the figures. And there right. is a change coming. Plus, of course, digitalization right. allows Africans now uh, to do things that they were they, they, they were they unthinkable before. Let me let me just say something cause, uh, <coughs> about China because it sounds as if we're too China friendly. Some people say that we're just trying to report back to the world what's going on. We're just not saying often say not saying it's good, bad, or indifferent. It's just it's happening. There are things happening in China that are not being reported, that are not being noticed, and we notice them and people say, right. oh, you're so friendly with China. Mm-hmm. No. I mean, we wish uh, all countries well, including China, but it's not that we have a special thing for China, although it's a fascinating place to study. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And it's partly because so much is happening. Right. Yeah. Right, but again, the Southern Belt. I totally understand and also agree that China is a part of this uh, movement to end the Western dominance. But what do you think about... It's the leader. Yeah, it's the leader. But what do you think about the Islamic Arab countries? What's the future there? 
uh, North Sahara. When w uh, mm. North Sahara is the problem zone, yeah. and uh, it's mm -hmm. it's not possible to predict. But you don't include those countries no. in the No, when we are talking about in the uh, rays no. of the southern no. Uh, no. world. No, it's no. sub-Sahara. You exclude sub-Sahara. Yes, sub-Sahara is yeah. it? Yeah. Well, Morocco is is mm -hmm. one that is uh, you know doing uh, something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, mm -hmm. but it's it's sub-Sahara. Mm -hmm. I see. And one shouldn't forget that the trading streams mm -hmm. among those countries are increasing dramatically. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's also one thing that uh, you shouldn't for one shouldn't forget, uh, that uh, oh. the trading she uh, uh, streams of the 20th century were different than the trading streams are going to be in the 21st century. And uh, a very good friend of ours who lives in China for the past mm. 20 years, he, he said a very good line. He said, you cannot beat the dragon anymore. Right. You have to chase the dragon. Mm. Look where China goes. Look where they invest. Because those are going the zones, mm -hmm. going to be the zones where there will be economic growth, where there will be increasing trade and so forth. So that's a, a, a very uh, a good uh, tactic to, mm -hmm. to, to, to look. In, in this regard, I just say, there's, it's shocking. It was shocking to us the first time to look at South America and to see all the countries and how much is b being invested country by country by China and how much they're doing right. in South America. No one talks about that. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 that's part of what's going on in the world. But what do you think about this new nationalism all over? This new protectionism? This, uh, this building new walls? What do you think about that? Will that change? your view on the trends of the world? Well, how much of that is going on and how much of it is mm. successful? Mm. But it, it started on now. Us. It yeah. But it depends on mm -hmm. us. And, and I think the, the, the big problem is that uh, we decide about a future. Uh, we uh, uh, elect politicians. But where is the education in, in politics? How are, uh, how are we introduced in, into the responsibility we have by voting for one or the other person mm -hmm. uh, or party? Uh, why do we not pay more attention to uh, educating our children uh, because those are the ones who will create the future. Right, but you are not afraid that borders and walls will be a trend of the future. The borders and, and walls. walls. And yes. walls? Walls, walls, like iron curtains. Oh, no, the reverse. New iron curtains. No, the reverse. Mm -hmm. So no, you're optimistic. A, a, a true, uh, uh, no, I, I think mm -hmm. anyway, a true globalization, uh, and globalization uh, it has a bad name now because of the, of, of the way it's been handled and so forth. But no, what's I the world is globalizing. That's it's ridiculous to say that's over. What I'm, I'm not so optimistic as you do. I, I, I would I'm very optimistic. No, I would differentiate between because you know, the, because that's <laughs> where the turn. That's where the action is. Yeah, but uh, Europe is uh, is oh, building up walls. Europe. Oh, is Europe, absolutely. No, no, no. Yeah. We talked about that earlier. Yeah. Up there. Okay. Up there in the north, forget it. That's over. That's after 200 I years. Mean, we, we can't say it's over because <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's going <laughs> down. Can turn well, it's going people down. It's not up. growing. I know. It's not growing. But it's never too Come late on, to turn around. Come on, let's get something going in 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 in, uh, in Europe and in America. It's not happening. Yeah. Today I had a talk with an American, who uh, said that Europe has a you. Had the Euro has no immigration policy. It has a policy of humanitarian immigration, but it doesn't look for talented people. Would you agree to that? He said, he said, you know, he said the question is not what can we do for them, but what can people coming here do for us? And that would be another choice. You think this is cynical, or you think this is something which is in favor of Europe, would be in favor of Europe? Well, it's mixing apples and oranges. It's mixing, it's mixing, the, there, there, there are people who come to Europe 
who come because they have an idea, because they want to work. There are people who come there because they want to get away from where they were, and they don't have too good of an idea. I mean, it's not that they're, they're all the same that are coming. It's a great mix of people, and in that mix, you got, you got some negative stuff, you got some very positive stuff. You know, you got to sort it out. Mm -hmm. but and I not treat everyone the same. I read that you said somewhere, people coming are a present. Oh yeah, Would because you still look say at the demographics. Now? Uh, people are what? Uh, uh, Who uh, come uh, are a present for Europe. More, more yeah. Would you say that even after all the problems which are raised in Europe till that we have populism and right wing? Well, Europe uh, needs all the help we can get, by yeah. the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need immigrants. Mm -hmm. We need it's immigrants. It's a demographic, Absolutely. Uh, a very simple demographic thing that, that yeah. we need people who come, but uh, we don't have uh, 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 any uh, global governance, we don't have any European governance mm -hmm. uh, where um, people, countries are quarreling. I'm not going to take anybody. Mm -hmm. and but do we attract people enough to come to Europe? Ambitious Chinese or ambitious South Americans. Is there a policy to attract people? Well, there's been a change, hasn't there, in the last number of years from, from you know, attracting people to people finding a place they can escape from where right. they are now. Mm -hmm. And th that's gotten all mixed up with itself, right. with, each, with each other, those, mm -hmm. those two phenomena, mm -hmm. which we have to sort out. Mm -hmm. uh, Germany is, is attracting people partly, but mm -hmm. still the people leaving, uh, being attracted, by other countries mm -hmm. um, is, of course, uh, much higher. And again, if you look at China, they have a thousand talent program, they have a foreign experts program. Uh, they are creating incentives mm -hmm. uh, for the people to come. People don't come to China for nothing. They come for a good reason. Well, you too, I mean, you teach in China, you go there very often, but still you prefer to live in Vienna. So my question <laughs> is, is life more comfortable in Europe and especially <laughs> in Vienna? <laughs> well, we, we, we don't have to settle on one place. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can live in, in a multiple places, experience very different things because the world is different everywhere. And we don't want to be stuck in one mm. place <laughs> with one lifestyle, with one, one return for us. We, mm. we have to experience the whole world. <laughs> Uh, our talk is now coming to an end, <laughs> and <laughs> I would just like to ask you, if you had the choice to live in some period in the past, or to live now, or to live in some period in future, where would you like to live? Where he is. Where he is, and you? <laughs> oh, I lost you him. where he <laughs> is, great. <laughs> and you? <laughs> 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 well, I, I would like to live and we would like to live, and that's what we do, mm -hmm. where things are happening, where there's interesting things going on, on where, where there's positive things going on. That's why we travel so much. Mm -hmm. That's why we spend so much time in China, I among many other countries. Yeah, we don't want to be limited. That's We fantastic. don't want to be limited and be sort of be get intellectually right. fenced in. I think this is a great last statement. <laughs> so thank you both very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.